Hello, welcome to Ask a Nerd. In today's episode, we're talking about energy efficiency and heat energy. In a modern automotive internal combustion engine vehicle, perhaps two thirds of the energy is lost to heat and noise. By comparison, electric vehicle systems are much more efficient, less than 5% of the energy lost between the energy from the battery and provided to motive power. Despite those lower losses, we still need to manage that heat energy, particularly around um, thermally sensitive components and materials. So let's jump in. I'll hand you over to Cecile, who's going to introduce our guest. For Hi, everyone. So for those who know me, my background is a CFD. I have been working in modeling and CFD for many years, and I have even sold a software for automotive industry. And of course, today, I really wanted to know where we are and to understand what can we do today with CFD, because we know batteries are a lot of chemistries, but there are also a lot of other components. And as Thomas explained in the introduction, a lot of thermal management. And for that, we are going to ask another. So welcome to our next episode. I'm going to present our guest in a few minutes. So we are again here for about 40 minutes. We have some uh, educational content. We will talk about what is a thermal management and why is it important inside batteries. We will introduce some of the cooling strategies that can be used for EV and uh, battery system. We will detail a little bit uh, what can be the heat sources. And it is important to understand it's not only the chemistry and the cells. We will, after that, talk about what is uh, the simulation, so the 3D computation, what we call CFD for battery, and how is that used in, uh, in the engineering, in developing true uh, EV and uh, electric vehicle components. And we will talk about uh, the design of a good quality simulation and uh, how is that used today in the industry. So we are now welcoming uh, our guest. Um, can you present yourself, Emin? So hello, everyone. My name is Aimee Suisse. I'm working as a manager for battery thermal management at Valmet Automotive. Uh, we are, a, among each other, we are a tier one uh, suppliers for um, battery systems. And we are a growing company, uh, mainly working on uh, batteries uh, and building up batteries from concept phase till uh, development, testing, and also uh, producing batteries. A usual question I have for our guests, how do you end up in an electric vehicle? What is your background? Have you been always in this uh, electrification or? Well, uh, the electrification starts already at uh, during my studies. I was part of uh, the Formula students uh, teams at the University of Stuttgart where I studied there as a mechanical engineer. And that was the first uh, contact with um, electric vehicles and also batteries. Mm -hmm. and from that moment, um, I started working with batteries and mainly with thermal management of batteries. Okay. So we know thermal management is important for batteries because we know that uh, the heat can damage uh, the cells and um, it can degrade, it can age the battery and it can create a lot of problems. One thing important for me is to insist of the fact that thermal management is not only about the heat around the cells, but thermal management on an electric vehicle is a lot of things. So I have one of my cards explaining this, including things about uh, the battery cells, uh, the cooling we can have, cooling plate, immersion, all the piping around this, but also things people do ignore more things like uh, the past, the thermal gaps that can make the contact, or also things like uh, opening and closing of uh, electric shutters and things like that. So in your job, um, do you simulate uh, things only about the cells, the battery, or do you have another view also of all this system when you develop something? So for developing a battery thermal management, the first thing you have to understand um, the amount of heat generated in the worst case, and then you have to understand um, the um, design that you need to make sure that this heat is dissipated. And it starts with a the cell, then it goes, as mentioned here, to the thermal interface materials. So every time you have cells you and you have to dissipate the heat to cooling plates, you have some materials between 
that conducts the heat. Then um, to cool the batteries, you need kind of coolant most of the time. And therefore you need like a cooling system, uh, which, uh, which is made out of pipes and connectors. And um, on the pet on the on the vehicle level, uh, you need also other components uh, for the uh, cooling circuit, like uh, pumps, valves, uh, radiators, um, etc. And um, so all of these are things you are also taking into account today in your daily job and development. I mean. Yeah. So the, especially the pump, or um, they give us somehow the boundaries for the development of our batteries. Sim like the the amount of coolant that we can use to cool the battery but also the design of the battery how much space do we have to integrate our cooling system these are very mm -hmm. important um, boundaries needed to design a cooling system um it's also important to most of the time when you see people trying to make a simulation very often they just consider what we call the jelly roll so they just consider like making the assumption that a prismatic cell is just a simple box. But when you look inside uh, a battery, you have the jelly roll, but it's roll up. So you have the collector. So you will get uh, pins that will get uh, all the currents up to um, the pole of uh, the batteries. And you have also things like how the tabs are made, how uh, the cells are connected to each other. Is that also things you have to take into account uh, or is that advanced to this point? I mean, I imagine that you are not making just a box when you are doing the simulation of a cell, yeah. right? So um, the main two goals for thermal management, the first one is to reduce the heat generation as much as possible. And this starts with the cell and then the connection to, um, to the bus bars, cell connectors. And the other one is to uh, extract this heat through an efficient cooling system. And what you can see here is, uh, for example, um, on the left side, the simulation of the cell, the heat, mm -hmm. um, the heat or the temperature distribution on the cell. And just on the middle, you can see um, the jelly roll. So there, part, most, let's say for prismatic cells, most of the heat is generated and uh, the active material and the jelly roll. And then you have the connection to the anode and cathode. They are also generating part of the heat. And from that starts also the, um, the connection from cell to cell, for example, you need also bus bars that um, you have kind of small bus bars. They are whether uh, welded or screwed. Mm -hmm. And not only the components like bus bars or cells produce heat, but also the connections. So every time we are connecting electric components, they produce also heat. And I guess the type of connection, but also the material for the connection, if it's uh, aluminum, uh, copper, or things like that, you have to take those, all those properties in your simulation correctly, right? Yeah. The um, One example is, for example, um, copper and aluminum, they don't produce the same amount of heat. Also, depending on the cross-section of the bus bars, um, the heat participation differs also. So all this should be considered in the design and later also in the simulation. Do you do uh, in your job simulation sometimes at the cell level or are you focusing generally on the pack level? So our, our company, we are more like a system integrator. So um, we are trying um, to integrate all the components in the battery. So to design them in the concept phase and to integrate the different components. And most of the, of the time we receive the cell as let's say uh, sometimes a black box uh, mm -hmm. that we have to characterize by ourselves, but mm -hmm. also sometimes with um, some data that we can use for simulation. So if we talk now about how you can remove this heat from the batteries, we now focusing on the type of cooling, which is only a part of the thermal management, but the type of cooling. There are generally four types of cooling. And just for the sake of review here, I'm just explaining briefly some of them. So we have, um, I put in the same family um, cooling plate and serpentine because they are removing the heat from the batteries, either from the bottom or the top or both of the cells or either from the side. So side would be the serpentine, like for example, in Tesla. And cooling plate would be um, like, for example, in uh, the Volkswagen ID3. Um, 
it is a, for me the most common type of cooling. Would you agree with this? Yeah. So um, water glycol cooling is um, the most common type of cooling nowadays. It's also it's used by Tesla, also Volkswagen, Porsche, Audi, Mercedes. So most of the current cars who um, were introduced in the last years on the market or this year, they are using this type of uh, cooling. Um, but there are also some cars for uh, motorsport, for example, they are using um, other types of cooling. Yeah, We will talk about that uh, yeah. the, after this. Um, I put in this as a family of water glycol, but of course they are really different types because it depends if the channels are very thin or in between, uh, if they are flexible. There are a lot, lot of subcategories, but I put all of this under the umbrella of water glycol. Mm. If we extend these cooling plates and instead of was using water glycol, we can put refrigerant, which gets the ability to get uh, a two phase cooling. So it's not very common. I know BMW use this. I know also the Artura uh, of McLaren use this. Uh, I have personally never come across other than these two one using refrigerant. Is that something you you see sometimes also, or it's really not common for you the refrigerant one? Well, it to be honest, it's not very common um, to use refrigerant. I think the hardest thing with uh, refrigerant cooling is um, to control uh, the cooling system because uh, controlling um, uh, evaporation is quite harder. And the second thing, you you don't have the possibility to uh, heat up the system, heat up the battery in very cold conditions. So this is yeah. one of the hardest thing to do. But the mo I think they are using this type of cooling maybe due to um, integration. So you need mm -hmm. less components if you use refrigerant coolings because you have already the compressor for the refrigerant circuit and um, it might be less to integrate um, in the battery, less easier to integrate in the battery. So this might be one reason. So an important point you, you made is that, of course, we, here we talk about thermal management and most of the time people think thermal management means cooling of battery. But you're right, sometimes you need to heat the battery because if they get too cold, they are also deteriorate. So sometimes you need to heat the battery and the refrigerant gets the problem that it's difficult to heat. You can only cool, you cannot really heat yeah. the refrigerant. So there are, if I would have made this presentation uh, like a year ago, probably I would have said that air-cooled batteries are going to disappear because they were um, some kind of uh, first generation of some batteries like Toyota Prius, for example. And it was said that it, no one is going to use uh, air cool, but surprisingly, of course, things change all the time. And Mercedes came uh, beginning of this year at the CES Las Vegas, announcing that their new uh, electric car, the EQXX, would be air cooled. And for me, it was kind of surprising. I can, of course, understand the assumption. Was it a surprise for you that uh, Mercedes came with air cool for their next generation of batteries? Well, it, I'm also surprised and I, I really want to see the car with air cooled on, uh, on the street when it's the serial production starts. Um, regarding air cooled of the Mercedes, my guess that uh, they worked a lot on the cell. So um, maybe with other companies, uh, cell producers, so the cell produce less heat as possible. So maybe they worked a lot on the cell resistance, electrical cell resistance. Um, this might be one of um, of the optimizations that uh, Mercedes, maybe with other partners, made so that the battery produces less heat and uh, they can cool down the battery with uh, only uh, air. But let's wait. It's it's quite surprising. Air has a very uh, low heat capacity um, and. Yeah. Something to mention here is the cooling are, of course, helping the battery to not deteriorate, but at the same time, it uses energy. So using air cool also allows you to get a better efficiency. And we know that Mercedes absolutely wanted to target the highest efficiency because they are less than 10 kilowatt hour uh, for 100 kilometer, which is super good consumption, very low consumption. So probably they have chosen air cool for keeping this, but you're right, they must have work on other things because otherwise uh, 
it's difficult. At the same yeah. time, I don't believe they can very fast charge because uh, if you do not cool a quite strongly, fast charging starts to be a problem. And talking about fast charging, you can talk about immersion cooling because it's clearly an enabler for very fast charging. And you mentioned uh, the slide before that it is used for, let's say, high performance car and uh, racing applications. Mm -hmm. um, again, immersion cooling is a family of cooling. There are single phase and two phase flow immersion cooling. Uh, and we start to see some specific cars. So uh, the Conisei Gregera is a hybrid, but it's an example of uh, immersion cooling. Uh, but we see a lot, lot of interest. Personally, I have questions about immersion cooling all the time. Is that what do you think about immersion cooling? What can you say about this development at this moment? Well, I think immersion cooling is coming uh, in the next years. Uh, the um, the most the biggest advantage of immersion cooling that uh, you don't have the interface between the coolant and um, and the cell anymore. So the you don't need like mm -hmm. a thermal uh, gap or uh, thermal paste anymore. And also the structure uh, of the cooling plate or of the housing is not there anymore. So you directly cool the cell. Maybe mm -hmm. the biggest uh, challenge there is how to keep uh, the system tight when you have uh, uh, direct cooling of the cell. So this is maybe one of the um, of the biggest challenges and also the integration of uh, immersion cooling. Uh, if we are talking about cars that already have uh, a very limited design space, and then you have to integrate uh, another cooling circuit uh, with oil. This means that um, pro most probably more space is needed. Um, this is uh, what I think, or maybe there is a new platform which is uh, uh, made and uh, the idea is to integrate the oil cooling there. But I think for the performance, fast charging for, um, let's say for, uh, for driving with high speeds, uh, this this is uh, the best um, cooling system. You also mentioned that they are using oil. Uh, of course, they are not using water because water direct in contact with uh, the cells would not be a good idea. So they are using uh, dielectric most of the time. They also can use ester. Uh, do you do you perform sometimes also simulation on immersion cooling? I guess yes. Well, it's to be honest, it's new in the market, so not a lot of people are working with that. Um, but we expect maybe in the future, if we have some projects with uh, direct oil cooling, that we will perform this kind of um, simulation, but also investigation on on the system level, because people think always a simulation uh, can give you um, feedback if the cooling system is working or not, but it's more com complicated. It's also related to material compatibility. Is the oil compatible with the material used within the battery, different plastics, uh, copper, aluminum, um, how the cells also uh, react with uh, this uh, oil long term? This is also a very important topic. So we have talked about the cells, but there are a lot of things making heat source. So any electrical components will make source. Uh, you have to take into account a lot of things, the connector. You mentioned also in the introduction things like connection, bus bar. And in previous episodes we have made, we have talked, for example, in episode two with Lotus, we also, of course, talk about the cooling of the electric motor because it's very important. Uh, also in uh, power electronic, anything on inverter, on uh, BMS, like we have on uh, Ask Nerd episode one. So are you taking account yourself? You are making simulation on batteries, but are you taking into account some of these components also sometimes for some simulation you are doing? Yeah, for sure. So um, w when we look at a, a full system uh, or when we design a full system, um, we always look at the different competents that produce the heat. Um, it starts with the cell, then the cell connectors, the connectors from the cell to the cell bus bars, then also the HVB levels, uh, the HVB connectors, who um, who have also quite uh, an electrical resistance, but also the bus bars. The bus bars are one of the main, um, as we can see here, um, these are one of the main um, heat sources. Because every time mm -hmm. we have different modules, um, these modules should be 
need to be connected electrically with each other. It depends if they are connected uh, parallel or serial. And um, these components also produce heat. And um, every time heat is produced, this might also lead that this heat might come into and directly to the cells also. And this should be also considered that um, the cells are not overheated uh, due to other connections, not only to due to uh, cell overheating, uh, cell self-heating. So cells could also get heat from other components. So I put also on uh, the picture on the right, uh, in case people ask themselves what, he, what is it. Uh, it's um, what we call the TIM, so Thermal Interface Material. Uh, it's a sort of past that will be in between, like for example, module and uh, the cooling plate. Um, all these paths are super important because they are enabler for uh, heat transfer. I guess you also take this sort of material into account, right? Yeah. So uh, for for people who uh, who think what 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 this uh, what is this material, maybe if they open one day their PC and they check the CPU, like the processor, and under the processor there is also similar paste. And the idea of this material is um, is to transfer the heat from the modules or from the cells to to the cooling plate. So what we can see on the right side. Um, this is applied maybe, I don't think manually, but most of the time through a roboter. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the uh, the modules which are containing the cells, they are pressed on uh, pressed on the housing. So what we can see here, this might be a housing of a big battery, and they are pressed um, on the housing. And uh, through pressing, we might uh, we should get like a, a uniform uh, contact surface between the cell modules and the housing, so the heat could be transferred directly from the modules to the housing and then to the cooling plates. It's also worth mentioning that uh, we do that because we do not want any air gap in between, because air isolates and will stop the heat transfer to be correct. So when you yeah. put that, you have no air, of course. So that's a nice transition to talk about the power electronic. So power electronic also generate a lot of heat. I think all of us, when we use a computer, as you say, we know electronic stuff generate a lot of heat. Um, here, this is a, a picture I've made uh, on a booth at uh, Battery Show. And uh, this company told me this is a, a cooling for the electronic on an inverter, for example. And we can see inside that there are specific structures to increase the heat transfer, I mean, to, to create more surface for heat exchange. Um, there are a lot of kind of uh, cooling things. So some of them can involve to get a fluid. Some of them can be only through the metal. Um, also, something surprising is that here it's copper, for example, not necessarily aluminum. You also do uh, this sort of simulation for power electronic or yourself, you focus more on the battery side. Well, I am focusing more on the product design, on the design of the cooling system. I'm not really, my current job i'm not really um, involved in inverter simulation um, but inverters are similar to batteries to electric motors every time we have an electric components um, it's made out of uh, out of materials that have a maximum operation temperature that should uh, not be exceeded and uh, also for the performance of these components whether it's an electric motor or an inverter or batteries we should make sure that the components work at their operation temperature. So sometimes it's okay to exceed the operation temperature a little bit higher for an inverter or for an electric motors, but um, we should reach the uh, operation temperature. I think for batteries, lithium, lithium ion batteries, like 40, 50, 45 to 60 degrees, mm -hmm. like most of the time for electric motors, it's, it's higher. And, like, uh, Let's remind that 50 degrees is not that much because if you are somewhere and outside it's already 40, 45 during the yeah. hot summer. If you park your car uh, under the sun, then uh, you can very quickly be 50. Yeah, degrees. yeah. It's uh, with the global warming, it's it's gonna get even worse. <laughs> So now let's talk really much. We have talked about uh, thermal management. Now we talk much more about the CFD on itself. So. I would like you to explain a little bit what are the advantages compared to experiment, because of course, 
a lot of the battery development will involve some experiments. So here I put a picture of a climatic chamber. So for those who are not familiar, here you have two parts, one bottom, uh, one top, one bottom, and you will place some batteries here and you have a lift that will very quickly go from the top to the bottom and on top you have very hot temperature and when it's go down you go very cold and you can do shock down like that you can do a lot of things you can do that more easily on simulation can you talk about what kind of simulation you can do what uh here we together put something about 1D simulation. Maybe people are not familiar what it means, what is 3D simulation, and what can you check, yeah. for example, on the simulation? And so, the so on the left side, what you can see is the climate chamber. Um, so most of the batteries, but also other components are tested in climate chamber. So basically the idea is with the climate chamber, you create an environment which is similar to the reality when you're developing a component. Um, and the idea is to have, let's say, small batteries or electric components. And you try to simulate the behavior of this component, um, like the load profile, um, mm -hmm. the environment temperature there. And you put like different sensors, for example, temperature sensors, or if you have a cooling system, uh, pressure sensors, volume flow um, sensors to detect um, or to regulate, to control uh, the heating. And the good thing about climate chambers, um, they provide quite accurate results when it comes to um, testing, but they are most of the time cost and time consuming. So to build a prototype for a battery or for an electric motors, you need a lot of money. Um, and then one other, Another topic is the um, the 3D effects and the insights that you have uh, on the climate chamber. You can only check the temperatures at certain areas, for example, on the structure or between the cells or um, on the cells, but you're, you're not able to check every detail within your battery or how is uh, in detail the heat path. And therefore, what you can see on the right side, um, the simulation is able to do that. So even though the simulation doesn't have the same accuracy as testing, it could deliver a better insight. Uh, so we can see in the picture in the middle, the 3D simulation, we can see the heat distribution within a battery. If we do that with testing, we might need hundreds of sensors. This, this might not work most of the time, or it's very expensive. And um, the cost and time, so simulation uh, need less time than testing um and they 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 don't cost as much as uh, testing also and on um, the upper side sorry yeah about uh, you say it goes much quicker when you do a simulation like that not counting the time you have to set up the simulation and everything but just the running time um let's imagine you work on a module maybe not a full battery pack but on a module how long would be a simulation like that are we talking about something that run in one hour one day one week well, if, if you have experienced engineer and you have good um, uh, uh, computing um, capacities, like let's say if you're uh, running your simulation supercomputer with all the steps uh, in CFD, which we will talk about later, you might need one and a half week, two weeks. It depends on the complexity of the model. And That's too long. Is... I mean, the shock, uh, the shock term can also run... Uh... It's uh, it's still long for a simulation. So yeah, um, but we're talking about the whole preparation, like yeah. stretching from the design that you have to prepare, that you have to uh, to check all the material data, etc. But for running the simulation by itself, it's it's a couple of hours. But for the analysis, etc., you need you like also, one or two weeks. Yeah. You also mentioned you are using supercomputer. Can you also explain to people what super what you mean here by supercomputer? Well, I used in the past supercomputers, um, not now. Um, supercomputers are um, somehow um, a lot of process, like um, it's a possibility to run your simulation in parallel on a lot of processors, it's called par parallelizing. And um, this reduces the amount of time that the simulations need. So, so these are... Instead of running like 20 hours on one processor, you can run like one hour on 20 processors. 
Yeah. So this is similar. Um, yeah. And this is this concept. Yeah. Something you have not mentioned, but uh, on the climate change, this is a picture I also made. Um, these climate change are clim climate. Sorry, climate change. I'm doing stupid. Thing. Climate chamber. <laughs> um, they are they are quite big, but you cannot yeah. put cells so big. So it's possible to test cell level. It's possible to put some module level. But of course, you cannot do in this kind of uh, setup. You cannot do a full battery pack, for example. Yeah, I, they are they are bigger one. So they are bigger uh, one, but they are super rare. And in this case, you're right. They are super expensive. Yeah. And I'm, personally, I've never seen a, a climate chamber that you could really put a, a complete battery pack that would be like. 400 kilograms, for example. I've never seen that. I well, there are some, yeah, they are quite expensive, um, but there are some, like some companies, engineering companies, but also um, car manufacturers, they have this kind of, um, also tier one suppliers, they have this kind of uh, testing capacities. Um, so now, if we talk about example of simulation, um, so we you mentioned you can do a lot of things on uh, the cells, on the module, on the pack, but there are also other things like uh, all the fluid pipe that can go through and running everywhere. Uh, I guess you can also simulate to, you mentioned that also pump. Um, are there other components you, you can include in your simulation? Do you make full system of the cooling sometimes? Or? Yeah, yeah to, to design a battery, there are a lot of... Uh thermal or hydraulic simulation that uh, that need to be done. So what we see on the right side, for example, I guess this is an example of uh, flow distribution simulation. Mm -hmm. So every time you have um, you have a lot of modules um, or subsystem of a batteries and they are connected to to the cooling system, you should make sure that um, that the amount of coolant is depending on the system is uh, is similar or even. Therefore, you have to simulate um, also um, the system. So you have to design your pipes that every component is getting the right amount of uh, of liquid to be cooled. So this is what we can see on the right side. Then uh, in the middle, um, in the bottom, this is um, one example of uh, thermal um, runaway simulation. So in thermal runaway, um, we have two things that we need to simulate mainly. First, the uh, degassing of the cell. So cells, when let's let's say when you have a nail going through a cell, there is a gas that um, there is a degassing. The, mm -hmm. It should be also simulated, but also the heat propagation. So um, the heat, which means like um, how the heat is propagating from one cell to another. And this is very important uh, for the safety of the battery. So we don't want, if there is, an issue that happened on one cell, we should make sure that the heat um, and this cell is starting to uh, propagate. We should make sure that um, the cell doesn't propagate that fast. Do you yeah. systematically make a simulation for runaway on any battery pack and any design you try? It's, yeah, it's, to be honest, it's quite a complicated topic currently in the industry, this type of cells. We are um, working um, on, on that to develop this kind of uh, expertise. But currently, it's it's quite complicated because it involves also the cell chemistry and how the cells mm -hmm. behave. And this is, if you are not a cell manufacturer, uh, it's really hard to uh, to do this kind of simulations. That's why today um, most of the expertise is um, is uh, at the cell level. So the cell manufacturers they they know the best about their cells. But if you say if you talk about the runaway, I do agree. But if you talk about the thermal pro thermal propagation itself, maybe you still can manage it a bit, right? Yeah, um, yeah. If you make assumptions, for example, how much heat is um, is generated, uh, then you can make this kind of simulations. But it's as I said, it's quite complicated because it, you have chemical uh, exothermic uh, reactions. Uh, during thermal runaway, and these are for that you need like some chemical input. How which reactions happen at which temperature of the cell? May, yeah, maybe yeah. To conclude, um, also what what other simulation that could be done is uh, what we see on the left side. This is a cooling plate, so um, mm -hmm. pressure drop is also one topic that should be considered. 
uh, dim because um, it's uh, it's very important for the pump performance. And on the left side and the top, um, also cell manufacturers they simulate also their cells to see um, how heat is distributed within the cell. Do you see uh, a lot of? Do you have the impression that all the design you are seeing are all converging towards the same sort of things? Or are you the, do you have the impression that all the design you are seeing are very, very different from each other all the time? Well, to be honest, for serial um, production, like for cars that will produce uh, in a big number, um, currently we are seeing only uh, cooling plates. Mm -hmm. um, so what we are doing is... Um, simulating the full battery system to check the temperature the heat mm -hmm. distribution within the um the uh, full bet uh, within the battery system and then on the other side we simulate the cooling plate uh, or the cooling system with cooling uh, pipes connectors to uh, to check if the heat if the coolant is distributed in an even uh, way or if the pressure is meeting the requirement so if you now explain a little bit your job, how is made a simulation? So there are several things. So the first question maybe people can have is how you have access to this uh, 3D model. So how can you, most of the time, how you can get access to the design of a battery pack or a battery module? How can you do that? Yeah, so me personally, I'm working on the uh, design department. Mm -hmm. So we are the one making sure that um, a design is created what you can see on the left side this is a design of a, of a battery so the first step is um, the design department creates a design um, which including um, depending on the simulation including the cells the uh, structure so the all the materials around the cells and also the um, cooling system um something i want to mention here is that um for those who are watching this and would like to make simulation themselves, it's still possible. Um, first, so I made the, the, the picture here is a Taycan. And uh, in one of the projects I worked with the university, we worked with a, a benchmarking company called Ademaca, where we had, uh, we had the possibility to scan completely the battery pack. And I have reconstructed manually the battery pack with a with a CAD software. So I, it's possible to reconstruct it, but it's very painful. It took me days and days and days and days to do that. It's very painful. Another possibility is that there are things you can scan. So I have scanned myself this module, for example. You can scan it with a, a, a LIDAR, for example, and you can get access to this 3D model that you can re-import as a STL model. Uh, and you can do some of simulation. Of course, it's not very accurate because, of course, you do not have the CAD and uh, the tolerance we can be poor sometimes or not very good as you would get if you work with uh, the manufacturer directly. But when you want to do a student project, it's something you can do. It's possible. So you can still have some... And there are also um, benchmarks. So, for example, I know um, there are possibility to download some of... Uh, dummy i'm going to say uh, battery simulation to get example but what i want to mention is that as student it's possible to work on things that exist of course you work for a company making the true development but for student project who want to learn it's also possible to get access to something. yeah to start i think there are enough data on the internet and as you mentioned there are companies who are making benchmarking where they really uh, make a teardown out of the battery and check every component and out of that you can like people can really have uh, insights uh, within the battery. So when you have your design, which can be yeah. more or less painful, depending if you're working yeah. in a company that gets the design or not, then you have to do the setup. Uh, what do you mean by the setup? Well, for the setup, this is actually all the information and all the um, boundaries needed to be able to run your simulation to start mm -hmm. it and it starts with um w what i want to simulate so the first question is for which load profile i want to simulate my batteries is it like fast charging or is it like a vltp or is it um, another uh, another load profile 
mm -hmm. uh, or driving profile. So this is the first thing that should, uh, like every person who wants to run a simulation should know. And the second thing is uh, which material are used because um, the behavior that we get at the end depends on the materials used. So what are the materials for my cell, like the material uh, data of, um, of the um, housing enclosure, of the bus bars, of the uh, cell connectors, of uh, different plastics used, for example, for insulation or for safeties. And all these materials, we need to know their material data uh, like density, heat capacity, heat conductivity. And um, and then we need also to know how uh, the software is used um, in all the settings. And therefore, some knowledge about uh, fluid dynamics is needed. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what, what you can see here, what you wrote, is the uh, basic equations for fluid dynamics called Navier-Stokes equations. So these are the equations describing um, the... Um, the how the fluid um, behaves but that and, is already coded in the software you are using yeah it's just code yeah but nevertheless uh, the people should understand these equations yeah, and they true. should also understand what are they are simulating are they simulating only the fluid or uh, are they also uh, simulating the thermal behavior and uh, which kind of flow do they have the type of cooling that they have in all these settings when all these settings is done then they have hopefully working model, mm -hmm. we call a CFT model that uh, they can later run and uh, start their simulation. So the next step when you have set up this, you need to generate a mesh. Yeah. Uh, is that painful to make this mesh? Is that automatic? How that works for you? Yeah, I've, I've done it in the past. Um, so generating mesh needs a lot of experience because um, the mesh, um, decide somehow on the quality of your results later. So um, in the areas, I can like try to explain it very um, easily. In the areas where you have a lot of uh, high gradients of temperatures, for example, um, or you expect that uh, the temperature will change very fast, then you need to have a very fine, uh, like to refine your mesh to get good results. And this step requires um, an expertise from uh, the simulation engineer to know how to uh, make sure that the mesh uh, will later uh, will, will later leads to uh, good simulation results. Maybe for those who are not very familiar, the mesh is like a little bit the pixel you have. So yeah. if you want to get a lot of detail, of course, you need to get a lot of pixel to describe what you want. And if nothing happens, you do not care that yeah. you can put bigger pixel. Yeah. So, so in this mesh, for for the people who are who don't know CFT or FEM simulations, on every uh, point of the mesh, or on every surface, um, the different values that are important for the simulation, like uh, temperature or pressure, they are they are calculated there. And then, when you have that, you can run your simulation and make analysis as we have talked before. So. You analyze, you say thermal propagation, the cooling. Um, one question I have for you is when you run your simulation, do you make steady state result or can you make things that are transient? Well, for, for the first step, it's good to have a steady state simulation because the steady state can give you an idea if your simulation is realistic or not. And also steady state doesn't take a lot of time. So this is might be the first step to check uh, the behavior of the battery in a steady state. Um, and from that point, you can run other uh, more realistic load profiles, um, like, for example, fast charging or VLTP. Yeah. OK. Um, so I think, uh, Tom, will talk about a little bit the EV trend. I believe you have some questions around that. Uh, I will let you now with Tom to get some questions together. So if you consider this uh, at a system level, what would you say is the typically the most demanding condition in terms of thermal management or situation that you have to deal with for the battery? I would say fast charging and maybe some load profiles when it's um, when the car has to drive on the highway. And there is also sometimes a combination of like, uh, I know like for trucks, for example, 
they have to uh, to drive on the highway and during the uh, the break they have to charge so they have this combination of load profiles is quite uh, challenging uh, for uh, battery thermal management so maybe like on a, a long descent for a, a heavy truck but traveling at a, a low speed so no, no airflow that kind of thing yeah yeah um talked a little bit about materials and um Cecile mentioned the the new Mercedes, well, the EQXX concept being an uh, an air cooled battery, which you could argue is is also one way of taking the cost out of the pack. Um, do you think there's any other trends in terms of material selection or or design of packs that will come into batteries to enable lower cost EVs ultimately? Is there anything in there? So regarding materials. Um... Me personally, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, innovations in materials. One, one innovation in materials is maybe the um, the materials needed to uh, against thermal propagation. When you have like fire in the battery, how to keep the fire within the battery as long as possible, so um, the battery is safe. So there are some fire, some innovations regarding fire protection materials. I was on mm -hmm. the um, on the battery show at Stuttgart last week, and there has been a lot of companies dealing with uh, this kind of materials. And then there are innovations on the cell level. This is uh, a lot of uh, cell suppliers or cell providers. They are working on uh, on their cells to make them more efficient uh, and producing less heat. More efficient to sell, it obviously makes the yeah. game a bit easier. Yeah, and lightweight mm. materials also. This is a topic mm -hmm. for the whole car, not only for the batteries, like using lightweight materials um, to make the battery, because the battery can weigh, I don't know, up to 400, 500, mm. maybe even more. So using lightweight materials is also a topic to to increase the efficiency of electric vehicles. Mm. Also reducing the heat capacity as well. Yeah. Um, so you, you touched on thermal runaway as well a little bit. Um, I wonder, is there anything active in, in terms of cooling systems? So if you detect a cell that's going um, out of control in terms of its temperature condition, are there any um, any examples of active cooling strategies that are being adopted to try and mitigate, as you said, that the propagation of the heat from that cell to the rest of the pack? Well, I know most of like the passive, there are me passive measures um, and uh, this includes, for example, um, to put uh, like uh, a fire protection material, let's say, uh, between yeah. the cells. Yeah. So to make sure that the heat is not propagated very fast to the next cell. Um, regarding active measures, I think immersion cooling might be uh, the next step to mm. uh, uh, to uh, against uh, thermal propagation because every time you have the cells with they are within a liquid so if one cell uh, propagate like um, has a thermal runaway um, you have like a liquid uh, around the cell it's not directly con connected to another cell and therefore you might reduce um, or you might it's better against thermal runaway than to have a very compact system with uh, every cell is near the other one. Mm -hmm. So more chance of controlling the flow. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other question was around the um, the cooling system. So in, in making that step to uh, an air cooled system and taking away the pumps, um, what do you think? If you if you could sort of quantify, if you like, the power advantage, how much advantage is there in in moving to air cooling? Do you think? Well, this is a really good question. Uh, I don't really have the numbers, but I would say five to six percent, maybe. Mm. And, and in the in the case of the car is driving on the highway, but it's it's really hard to uh, to measure. I don't. I didn't deal mm. with this kind of numbers, but my estimation would be like around four, five to six percent. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question was around variation. So in you discussed kind of characterizing the cells from a supplier as as you know you could treat it as one thing and all cells are the same 
but clearly there's some variation in terms of production variation. Do you factor that into the simulation and, and how much impact does that have when you pass it out to a system level in terms of the accuracy of, uh, of the simulation? Well, it hasn't. Um, cell inaccur inaccuracy has a big impact on, on the simulation because um, thermal simulation starts at the cell or let's say the thermal path within the battery starts in, um, at the cell level. And there, if uh, let's if your cell model or the cell data that you're receiving is not very accurate, you might end up having um, a deviation between simulation and testing. And this is one of the main reasons why a lot of companies, uh, they, uh, they build up a system, they simulate it, and then they test it, and then realize there are big differences later. Mm. And nowadays, there are some companies working on cell characterization, so they get like the cell and uh, they make like a full characterization of the cell like uh, and, and do you find the cell to cell variation to be quite well controlled these days or is there still quite a significant issue with that in terms of real parts i don't think there might be a big i, I didn't experience a uh, big deviation in cells there might That's be true. like uh, deviations related to tolerances of cells in the prototype phase um but I don't think that this might affect the thermal management. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Amy. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we'll bring, thank you. bring back Cecile and um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cecile. Topic, talking about CFD, as I say, a long time ago, I was doing CFD. So. Yeah, me too. I, I was also doing a couple of years ago CFD. I'm still involved in, CFT and directly because um, we work also with uh, the simulation department. Uh, so we have to mention to people not to forget to subscribe to see to be notified of our next episode. We have also a lot of other episodes that can be watched on YouTube. And now so it's time to say goodbye, I guess. Right. Thank you very much. We'll see thank you. you thank episode. you, everyone. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.